ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of the Milken Institute, Michael Clowden. Good morning. Good morning. All right, good. That was loud enough to wake everyone up, get you, get you all here. It's great. Uh, it really is a pleasure to, to be able to welcome all of you here to our third annual Asia Summit. You're in for, I, I think, a treat over the next uh, two days. Uh, the, you know, the Milken Institute's mission is to advance global prosperity through our focus on widening access to capital, job creation, and health. Our Asia Center, which is based here in Singapore, uh, it first started just uh, in uh, four years ago, in 2012. We now have uh, nine folks who are uh, here in the Singapore office, plus another five uh, very distinguished Asia fellows who are in different countries in the region. Um, and we hold a number of events. We have uh, uh, we host our financial innovation labs. We have uh, a young leader circle to meet regularly. Our associates groups get together. We have regional leader uh, events, uh, a number of events through the year. But this event, uh, the Asia Summit, is sort of the highlight of the year for, uh, for all of us. Uh, and particularly for our staff here in the Asia Center. And uh, it's uh, really wonderful to have you here to participate in that. Now, in addition to our convenings, the Institute, of course, is a research organization, and in your bags you'll find examples of some of our recent research that touch upon Asia, and I hope you'll have a chance to read it and enjoy it. There are over 450 people uh, that will be with us today and tomorrow from 25 different countries. Uh, you represent a mix of uh, high-profile executives, government officials, influential investors. You all know whether or not you're influential. Uh, heads of sovereign wealth funds, philanthropists, uh, academics, and more. Uh, you as a group are what make this summit uh, possible because it's not only your attendance here, but your participation in dialogue among yourselves and with the panelists that will take the ideas that you hear uh, here over the next two days and turn them into actionable items in your own lives and others uh, throughout, throughout the year ahead. Uh, and so we thank you for the, taking the time to do that. And we also especially want to thank our sponsors and supporters who make this event possible. We'll be, their names are listed in the uh, of, uh, material in your program, but also uh, here on the uh, sides of the hall, and we'll be identifying them again at lunch today. But uh, we thank them because without them, this is not possible. Now, the theme of the summit this year, the forces shaping Asia. Asia's rapid economic and geopolitical rise has been a world success story. Now, as a region of constant change, it is tremendously important that we understand the dynamics that have shaped and will continue to shape Asia. We're going to focus on eight overarching, complex, nuanced, and interconnected forces during the course of the next few days. Security dynamics, economic integration, sustainable development, technological disruption, capital markets reform, philanthropic impact, population aging, and middle class growth. We'll be discussing a wide range of topics over these next few days. Uh, and we hope that uh, you will be able to participate in as many of them as possible. Now, we know you can't go to everything. There are three sessions at one time, most of the time. But don't worry about anything you may miss because everything will be online. And so if there are sessions that you're interested in but can't attend, please go to our website and you'll be able to see them afterward. Now, uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, uh, I want to just mention the Milken Institute app, uh, that you've all received notices of that. Uh, if you haven't downloaded yet, I recommend that you do so. That's the best way to get information about the panels, the topics, uh, and the bios of the speakers. So uh, please do that. You'll find that very worthwhile. Uh, and I also uh, should mention that, you know, while some sessions, most of the sessions will be room for everyone, especially when we have three at one time, uh, some of the sessions, particularly in the Windows East on the 20th floor, may fill up. If they do, our apologies, but if it's something that you're, it's important for you to be at because you really want to be there, I suggest you, you get there early. 
Um, and lastly, at about 12.05 today, um, you may or may not hear it, but um, if you do hear sirens going, it's because the Singapore government uh, is doing the annual test of the emergency uh, siren and warning system, which they'll be doing for a minute. So if you do hear it, feel free to ignore it. It does not mean that Godzilla, Godzilla has moved here from Tokyo. And it will go on with the session. All right. It's time to get started. And um, uh, we have uh, a wonderful panel, a very distinguished panel, uh, that is uh, uh, going to uh, lay the groundwork for the next two days. And uh, by the time we are through uh, with this morning's session, you're going to know everything there is to know about how to navigate an uncertain world. So please uh, welcome Jonathan Wessel and our distinguished panel to come on stage. Thank you uh, very much, Michael. And uh, it's it's a really a great pleasure for me to stand on this to sit on this stage with this panel and to have this chance to sort of address the issues of uncertainty in Asia. Um, let let us start though with uh, just a, a very short video, kind of laying out some of the views that you know, things that we might want to be discussing today. So if I could ask people to uh, run the video, it can take 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Uncertainties. That's why we're here. I think that uh, that sort of tees up a little bit about what are some of the issues and challenges uh, we face, uh, and Asia is really ground zero. Uh, I'd like to just start with uh, one over the, the title of the panel is Navigating an Uncertain World. So I'm going to essentially start with the panelists and ask each one of them this broader question about you know, what are the uncertainties you see and how would you navigate? Um, so I, I actually, if I could start right with, with Steve on my, on my right-hand side here. Steve, of course, is leading uh, Chief Investment Officer of Golden Tree, $25 billion asset under management, uh, tremendous track record of success. What, what do you see as the, uh, the uncertainties facing us today? What are the things on your agenda? Thanks, Jonathan. So um, a few uh, concerns, probably our biggest concern is in the U.S. The, uh, we're very late in the economic cycle. The last few cycles have lasted around eight years. That's where we are now, and are we going to be, um, you know, how long this cycle is going to last? And if, uh, if, if, uh, if uh, growth is negative, you're going to see a decline in an adjustment in, uh, in prices. Uh, now, we could be like Australia. That's 25 years of growth, but our best guess is we're going to resemble the previous cycles, and we're very far along. Then there is the global low interest rate central bank-induced policies. We don't think this is going to be a um, – I, I don't think history is going to look kindly on this. Um, if the reason why they, um, why they have low to negative rates was to encourage growth it just ha and to accelerate growth, it just hasn't happened. And as a result, you've actually taken an important central bank policy off the table. So um, – and then going to um, Europe, you have some uh, real um, 
issues in politics. So we actually have been pretty um, pleased with the growth in Europe. But when you see Brexit, you see with what's happening in Italy, they're going to have an important vote either in November or early December. We think that there are um, some, um, you know, that it creates material uncertainty. Now, against that backdrop, there certainly are ways to get returns. And, um, you know, we find that uh, each year you get opportunities, and having a flexible mandate allows you to get to get uh, um, opportunities really in any environment. So, uh, for instance, uh, you have uh, um, fallen angels. There was $170 billion on year-to-date of fallen angels, and I'm trying to pick some of the larger themes where um, there was a um, – more sellers than buyers that result in material um, opportunities. If you look at the quasi-sovereign um, debt, particularly of um, oil um, of state oil com- company issuers like a Pemex, where they used to trade right on back of the sovereign, and, and literally have gone from 50 basis point spread to 300 basis point spread, or being marginally, you know, call it maybe on t- on 10% wider in terms of yield, to li- literally double the yield. And uh, um, so we've seen some very good opportunities, and each year we see good opportunities to um, uh, to uh, create returns in the environment. Uh, well, great. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put those in the back of my head because, Mr. I want to let the audience know we're going to have a chance for today so you can, you can raise your own questions to, to stump the panel. Uh, but uh, if I could turn to the other end of it, so the view from – Switzerland, to be very clear, it's not part of Europe, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, uh, does, do you see us, I mean, this, you, I mean uh, Steve was highlighting the growth and the interest rate environment, things that we're kind of stuck with right now and the uncertainties around that. Do you see that as well, or are there other things you would be highlighting and, and implications for as well? Hmm. Well, as you point out, uh, Switzerland has this kind of peculiar uh, positioning in Europe. We are observing what's happening around us. And uh, I think the chief worries in Europe are really more political and actually ethical in nature rather than economic. I think the economics uh, in many ways is slow growth, but I mean, what would you expect of a continent that is in a way so rich relative to others? Uh, but I think what's really worrying uh, is, is the, the kind of uh, emphasis of borders, uh, emphasis of disruption, of breaking up, uh, rather than kind of getting together. And I think this is worrisome, particularly if you compare it to the history of the continent. And I I miss somewhat the respect for Europe as a kind of peacekeeping project right now. I think uh, more on on the financial side, uh, I see a huge opportunity. I mean, you mentioned this continuity in your movie at the end, and obviously that's the consultant talk of the day, this continuity. And I would see private markets uh, in general, and maybe the, the firm I represent, Partners Group, as a, one of the key beneficiaries uh, of discontinuities and dislocations in financial markets. Uh, because we do see private markets investing emerge as a kind of mainstream way of investing, Uh, next to public (coughs) markets and bank intermediation, both being seriously hampered by over-regulations, by zero interest rates, uh, by uh, volatility. Uh, And I think private markets, in a way, uh, emerges from having traditionally been a kind of opportunistic, uh, high-risk area in a a, a non-defined alternative basket, uh, to basically becoming a way of investing in its own right. And that's what we very much try to do with Partners Group, invest multi-asset, uh, provide mandates, uh, look for longer-term opportunities to be invested in private markets, and obviously achieve returns that are in the, still in the mid-teens, maybe not in the high teens as they used to be, but still in the mid-teens for equity uh, and in the low teens for infrastructure. So we do see opportunities. Uh, our firm invests in approximately 10 billion, raises about 8 to 9 billion this year expected uh, in mid-market companies, but also in infrastructure projects, uh, many of them in Asia. So we do see lots of opportunities from this disruption and discontinuity. Great. And then turning uh, to our host, Ravi, I mean, sitting here in Singapore in the Four Seasons Hotel, sometimes it's, it's perhaps, you know, maybe it, it, everything seems so stable, right? It seems so well organized and predictable. <laughs> There's a bit of a knock on Singapore, but is it fact so? Do you, I mean, do you, do, do you, do you worry also about uncertainties even, even in this region? Yeah, well, well partly so, uh, hardly uh, the case. Um, you know, the analogy is there's a swan that looks so perfectly serene and still on the uh, above the waterline, 
but you know, is paddling vigorously beneath to keep it, uh, keep the serenity. And I think that's pretty much the situation in small countries like Singapore, um, that to keep that stability amidst the turbulent world, you've got to work really hard and be proactive and constantly monitor the situation. I want to start with the uncertainties that don't matter. I think uh, first, and to say this as a central banker may seem odd, uh, monetary policy is vastly overrated in importance. Uh, unfortunately, that's what everybody is focused on, um, from the media to the analysts to the markets, uh, watching every move that the central banks have, are making. But as the chart shows, they have been, not been making a move for the last seven years. It's been basically very low interest rates for a very long period of time. Um, and now the debate has shifted to negative interest rates, additional quantitative easing, um, helicopter money, uh, new inflation targets, uh, nominal GDP targeting, all kinds of innovations thrown in to make and justify continuation of extremely easy monetary policies or a further easing of monetary policy, which I think completely misses the point about what is fundamentally ailing the global economy. Um, I think that what's fundamentally ailing of, of the, the, the trends beneath these noises that you see with interest rates and, and, and market movements. Um, first, we don't know why, but it is a very serious problem. Investment is weak. And if you take the United States, for instance, uh, housing markets have recovered, the labor markets recovered, unemployment rate is close to the natural rate, um, private consumption is, is, is good, chugging along, consumer sentiment is strong. The only part of the engine that's not working, uh, and that is a key part, uh, is private investment. Corporate America, despite its huge cash piles, is not investing. And that's got implications for Asia because it's not U.S. GDP growth that matters for Asia. It is U.S. private corporate investment because the entire global value chain of manufacturing is plugged into that, uh, from logistics to shipping to trade uh, to production. So that is a key part of the mystery that needs, needs closer attention. And it's not just in America. Uh, even in China, uh, public investment is strong. Private investment isn't. In Asia, uh, if you look at the ASEAN countries, again, a lot of uh, growth is being driven by domestic demand, rightly so, public infrastructure investment, very important. But where is private mm -hmm. investment? I think that's one big part of the uncertainty we need to address. The second one, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop after that, is trade. For the first time in <coughs> decades, global trade is growing slower than global income. And that's, now I don't know if that's a short-term blip in the data, if it's a fad, or if this is indicative of something more structural. And it's particularly con of concern to Asia, where trade growth, uh, in, in nominal terms, of course, trade uh, has declined, but that reflects the fall in commodity prices. But if you abstract for that and look at real terms, in volume terms, uh, trade has been stagnant. Um, now, again, is this due to sluggish global growth, or is there something more fundamental driving it? And I think we need to look deeper into some of the changes in, in industrial production, in changes in economic structure that might be driving this. <coughs> and if trade was the source of global growth and prosperity since the Second World War, um, and if trade is now growing slower than income, uh, are we entering a new era of uncertainty? Or is this symptomatic of something else that's happening and there'll be future sources of growth that <coughs> will not be related to trade? So I'll just leave with those, those two big uncertainties for now. Uh, well, let, let me push you a little bit, Ravi, on that. I mean, so we, the investment, you know, we, why hasn't the private sector investment sprung back or, or increased? And where, why is global trade growth? I mean, you've mentioned in both cases that there may be something more fundamental going on, a change in economic structure or uh, industrial, uh, industrial production itself is, 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 is different than it used to be. I mean, maybe you could elaborate. You know, first of all, you know, do you see that? Do you see something fundamentally different about the, the world economy? And then just to push, so what's Singapore going to do about that? I mean, uh, Singapore has already had a tra you know, track record of taking advantage of these things. So. We'd like to know. Well, okay. In a way, and this is pure hypothesis, and I'd really love to hear the views of uh, especially uh, uh, those in the corporate world. Uh, of course, the obvious reason is there's less confidence in future growth prospects. And so why invest when future growth prospects are weak? It's a bit of a vicious cycle because how do you get future growth prospects up if you don't invest now? So I think you're caught in that kind of trap. Now, as for why investment is uh, showing weakness and whether it's related to trade. Uh, <clears throat> there does seem to be a shift in uh, the nature of uh, investment itself. Uh, if you look at uh, the IT sector, for instance, it used to be that there were large investments in 
in, uh, in IT infrastructure, in uh, servers, in uh, data warehousing capabilities, and so on. Um, the shift now towards is more towards agile technologies, cloud services, uh, IT services that are for contract, and uh, many companies that we talk to tell us that they are no longer investing big time in big mainframes and in big uh, IT architecture, but they're shifting towards more agile solutions, more uh, IT services types of, uh, of, of uh, solutions, and whether there's something to it. And maybe that's also related to the slowdown in merchandise trade, uh, because when you don't have so many hardware, the economy is, use Ben Bernanke's term, is becoming lighter, uh, less assets, uh, more knowledge content, more design-centric, um, <clears throat> more software-centric. And if that's the case, that's not going to be picked up in trade. Um, you look at China, China's, uh, one of the big dramatic shifts in China in the last 10 to 15 years is a shift away from manufacturing towards services, away from investment towards consumption. That means less trade. And that we're already seeing the effects of that throughout Asia, um, where trading patterns, trade, trade volumes have started to shrink. And the other thing that's going on is insuring. Uh, more manufacturing plants are returning to the United States, um, producing nearer the market. Um, and within China itself, there's a lot more insuring of production. We used to have a very extended value chain across Asia, where uh, different parts of the value chain were, were broken up into small slices uh, in, across different countries. Now there's a lot more consolidation of those supply chains. Supply chains are becoming shorter. More of that is being insured in China because China has now developed the capabilities to produce along the entire value chain from upstream, higher value added, uh, component-centric kind of production right down to the more basic routine production kinds of activities downstream uh, and final export. And if that's going to happen, a lot more of it's going to be insured in China, then what does it mean for supply chains throughout Asia? So I think these are just conjectures I have at this point, um, um, but these are areas that we need to think very hard about because if we're investing for the long-term future, these are the trends we need to understand rather than whether, when the Fed is going to hide 25 basis points. Right, but in the, in, the, in the famous words of Keynes, in, in the very famous words, we're all dead in the long term, yeah. All along. So let me, let me turn to the investor <laughs> so, and, uh, and a builder at that. And uh, you know, Ronnie, Ravi was saying that the, you know, part of this is confidence in growth prospects and uh, animal spirits, maybe. And, and you sitting here in, in, uh, in Asia, do you see a, a drop in animal spirits and growth prospects really? I mean, is it, is it, are, are we that far gone yet? <laughs> Well, let's not forget the distinction between global and Chengdu. And if the things that were mentioned by previous speakers speak to some of the main concerns, then I would say the world is still okay. I think there's a lot more worrisome problems that I can see out there. But before, let me put it in a, in a little bit of context. Don't forget the Second World War is, was 70 years ago. And how long is a long cycle? Roughly 70 years. A lot of things in 70 years tend to change. And if you believe in cycles, as I do, then 70 years history show is approximately the time that things take a full circle. And so a lot of the things you, you see today, such as the trade flow diminishing, as Ravi mentioned, uh, such as interest rates, such as many other uh, aspects, it's really, if you were to put it in a bigger uh, cycle, then it's uh, perhaps a lot more understandable. A lot of the Westerners, I see a lot, mostly Westerners here, uh, I worry about a lot of things in Asia. Uh, let me tell you, those are not the things I worry about. I worry about things that you don't worry about for the Westerners. You worry about China's economy. I'm not worried about China's economy. China will be fine. Uh, <clears throat> why? Uh, because um, China is now, there's enough money, technology, management uh, in-house that uh, turn inward to consumption, forced by the rest of the world perhaps, but it will do okay. It's one of those few countries, with the exception of energy, they can basically do everything themselves. Uh, another, somebody mentioned in a Wall Street Journal event last night about TPP, worry about TPP. TPP doesn't worry one bit. If it goes to hell, so be it. Uh, there, were, there was no TPP as we speak today, and the world is already going in a particular direction. And trade is slowing, not because there's no TPP. Trade is slowing because of all, uh, other, a lot of other issues that were mentioned by Ravi and others. And so, yeah, nice to have TPP, but if it doesn't happen, so be it. We will survive. Another thing that I don't worry about is 
There's a country in the world today who is trying to make China into enemy, trying to bring the whole world back into the Cold War. It's called the United States, trying to turn China and, and, and Russia into, in, in, into Cold War rivals. That I don't worry also, because uh, uh, the United States won't succeed. Uh, because China doesn't want to fight, China dare not fight, America doesn't want to fight, America dare not fight, so what's the big deal? So you have Japan, <laughs> Philippines, uh, Vietnam uh, trying to stoke the fire, notwithstanding, no big deal, it just, uh, uh, it will blow away. Uh, there can be accidents, a lot, the Middle East is going to blow up a lot faster before this part of the world is going to get into those kind of trouble. So those are not the things I worry about. I just named a couple of things that, uncertainties that I, I do worry about. <coughs> Uh, the first one is uh, <coughs> terrorism. It has been uh, in Middle East, Europe, and U.S. This part of the world has been spared from it. But for those of you who know anything about this part of the world, you should worry about it. I think Singapore is fantastic. The police, the government, so competent. But a couple of years ago, there was something that has happened that looked like a newspaper happened here. And thank God that the Singaporean government foiled it. And then financial service centers, Singapore and Hong Kong, right? Indonesia, with 250 million people, uh, and, and of a particular uh, religious persuasion. So that's one thing that has yet to hit the part of the world, but surely it will. Another one, pandemics. Do you know that 75% of the world's influenzas, which kill, by the way, more than any other disease, come from one place, South China. And so far, they've been able to manage it, but as we all can tell, because of technology, because of transportation, uh, that kind of a thing is a worry uh, for all of us in anywhere in the world. Even in Singapore, uh, my wife uh, got uh, dengue fever here a couple of years ago, and Zika is now uh, 300 some cases, according to the taxi driver who told me last night. <laughs> yes, that was always right. Uh, uh, another one, uh, ne negative and intended consequences of technology. Everybody really sing the praises of technology. It's easy to do so. It takes more courage and a little bit of brain to figure out that there are negative consequences. Bill Gates at one time, he surprised that people do not focus more on negative consequences. So I said, the smart guys talk about technology. The real smart guys are going to start thinking about the negative unintended consequences of technology. And then finally, i just give you one other. This is related to this part of the world. You know, this part of the world, after Second World War, was considered to be um, the backwaters of the world, no hope. Uh, most people thought in those days that the best country in this part of the world after Second World War was Myanmar and the Philippines. Uh, look at it today, right? So from the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, this part of the world was neglected. In the 80s, 90s, 2000, this part of the world took off. And me being from Hong Kong was one of the beneficiaries. I used to come down here every two weeks. Uh, to Southeast Asia, milling around doing business here. Uh, perhaps cycles is taking this place again. Perhaps we're entering into another phase of troubled waters. Consider the countries around Singapore. Consider the fact that uh, Thailand, uh, so stable uh, in spite of you know, all the little coups every five, seven years, <laughs> uh, have been stable because of the, the king and military. The king is now 88. And uh, with all the ribbons that is flying uh, in, in, in Thailand, what will happen? Uh, Singapore, uh, sorry, Malaysia, very stable for a long time. And, and yet, I believe that Malaysia may be entering into some troubling political waters. Indonesia, has Indonesia gotten better once democracy came? Corruption is worse today than before democracy came. And so, you know, the West who, who think that once you have democracy, it solves all problems, in particular corruption, then twice. Even Singapore, in the post Lee Kuan Yew era, uh, they're certainly uh, <coughs> concerned. So anyway, uh, on and on and on. So this part of the world, I think, um, uh, geopolitically uh, as well as domestically, there's a lot to worry about. Uh, but the, the part that, you know, the South China Sea and all that kind of stuff, those are not worries. Uh, I don't lose a sleep uh, uh, for, for those reasons, but there are other issues uh, that are concerned, cyber security being another, but that's in the next session. So I, I kind of get the feeling from that. I mean, you're a believer in the positive outcome, but not after a period of, uh, of pretty dramatic <coughs> shifts in the, in the short term. Absolutely. Yeah. The cycle will dictate that we're entering into a different phase. Mm. Uh, and so, Mike. Now, you, you are, I mean, you built a, this, this institution based on understanding and insight and research. And so, as you look at these, 
you know, trends and, you know, where do you, what do you see? I mean, do you see these are the, are these the right issues that we should be thinking about? Or are there other ones that come to your mind? Well, in 1965, I wrote down this formula at Berkeley. And today, we're more than 50 years later. And, and I really use this as a basis for a lot of my thinking. And so the concept that prosperity, and we could say prosperity is job creation, to me, one of the keys is that prosperity is a meaningful life. What will 20 and 30-year-olds or 40-year-olds be doing? What are they thinking about? What role will they play? Will they feel their life is meaningful? And I think we've had somewhat of a breakdown in the access to capital. And there's a lot of reasons for that, where access to capital serves as a multiplier on the world's largest asset, human capital, social capital, and real assets. And I try to emphasize every time that we don't think about it, but the human capital element of education and quality of life and length of life has been the major driver of the world's economy. So when we talk about one of the great areas to be in in the last two generations, East Asia, what occurred? We had a 70 to 80 percent increase in life expectancy and improvement in the quality of life in East Asia. So with that, moving from life expectancy of 40-something to life expectancy of mid-70s, you have a whole different perspective on the world. And if your health is better, you have that perspective. So when I think back to that formula of access to capital, something that I spent 50 years working on, I think often about what is in the United States. So in the United States, we have tens of thousands of investors today who are making a decision of who has access to capital or not. So Steve Tannenbaum is making a decision, is he going to finance a company or not? And it's not dependent on the banks because less than 20% of all the loans are held by banks. But if I go to Europe today, it's still heavily dominated by the banks. And if I go even to China today, where is the state-run governments are only 1% of the companies, uh, 70 or 75% of all the financing by the large banks in China is still going to state-run. And so I think about some of the questions that were raised. Why haven't we been successful? Well, I think back at the depression in the world. And my parents and many of the other people's parents who lived through World War II or the Depression, they were more conservative their entire life. They remember that period of time. And I think the shock of the financial crisis of 07 to whenever has made everyone more conservative who's running financial institutions and corporations. And so when you look at, say, the countries of the world, let's start with Japan today. In 06, prior to these issues, Japanese companies had about 21% of the liquidity relative to the GDP of Japan. Today, it's 125%. They have an extra 5 trillion U.S. Why are they not investing? Why is Toyota at all not investing in the future? Okay, and it was partly, I assure you, the the jarring to the nervous system during that period of time. If you look at the U.S. today, it's doubled, but it's 32 percent uh, of liquidity. And so what you travel around the world, a system of trying to build institutional investors, and our global capital markets group here at the Institute has over 20 trillion. These are non-money managers. Now, if we go back to that previous slide and look at it by country, you can see Almost all countries, corporations, have dramatically increased the percentage of cash versus where we were. So one, it's quite possible that the decisions are being made by human beings, and those human beings still have the memory of a very difficult period of time. If we look at the individuals, in 1988, Japan's stock market made up 40% of the world stock markets. It went from 9 to 40, back to 8 today. And that enormous loss of value in real estate and stocks weighs on a country that has a, the, 
the oldest population in the world. And so individuals in Japan today have 17 trillion in cash yielding zero. <coughs> On the other side of the coin, you have enormous opportunities for investment. And so what I see it, we might need to change who's making these investment decisions. If you think of the companies that are the most valuable, let's say in the United States and the world, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, now even Alibaba, if you look at these companies, they don't view their customers as those that are in Silicon Valley. They don't even view their customers as those that are in the United States. The world is their customer. And I would say one reason why traditional measurements of trade shows it declining are many of the issues cited, but the other thing is the percentage of the world's economy that moves digitally increases every year. So when you judge the world's economy, when your smartphone will be your doctor and your smartphone is your bank, okay, you have a whole, you're not calculating world trade. So less of the world's economy is going to move on ships and trucks, etc. from that standpoint. And so we need to look to the future from this standpoint. And it's quite possible, just like those that lived through the Depression, became very conservative their whole lives, that those that lived through this last financial crisis. And so what I see as one of the potential is that we need to shift the capital and the decisions on allocating that capital to new companies. When you think that Facebook, less than 15 years old, is one of the six or seven most valuable companies in the world, it, doesn't have, it didn't have the most liquidity in the world. Apple only had $15 billion in cash before the start of the financial crisis. And so these companies have seen so many opportunities. And if you think of our traditional companies, Macy's, Walmart, Walmart the largest employer in the world, is only valued at 115,000 employees. So you're now the CEO of Walmart. You have operations all over the world. You can't afford dramatic increases in your expenses. If you're going to raise wages a dollar, that's $4 billion a year. Now, if I'm Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg, and I'm worth $27 million an employee, I can attract better employees, offer more benefits, and a bunch of things. So I think we <clears throat> have to transition to a 21st century world not a 20th century world. And if you look at a, at a world that used to be so focused on natural resources, and if we took the automobile, 60% of the cost of an automobile was natural resources. Well, the microchip natural resources are 2%. And we have to reorient our, our thinking. Why is Asia so important? Well, first, 60% of all the people in the world live in Asia today. And what happens in Asia is going to affect the world. And I think, as Ronnie said, Asia is just not China. Asia is Indonesia, Malaysia, and the country that will have the largest population in the world, India, here shortly. There's, it's a very diversified sector of the world. And I sit and ask myself every day, okay, what are the opportunities? Now, I'm not as worried about Zika and these viruses because modern technology today will allow us. We can now get rid of the mosquito. That particular mosquito that spreads malaria, Zika, Gungi virus, etc. We have, if we want, at our disposal, through genetic <coughs> correction, spell check of a gene, CRISPR technology, today we could, in a mosquito, change the DNA so they cannot reproduce this particular now, are we going to do that? This is an ethical question. If we eliminate this particular one species of mosquitoes, okay, it's going to change the world for those that have malaria and fever, and we're not going to be worried about the Zika virus, but we've had movies made, you know, when we get rid of this one little fish, the whole world is destroyed. So are we going to use the power the birth of precision medicine and advances in science, I think about sub-Saharan Africa. 
Africa has 1.2 billion people. The UN is projecting it to go to 4.4 billion. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. But I think we have to assume that the entire increase in the world's population in the balance of this century, net, is going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. Are they going to be the terrorists that Ronnie spoke about? What are their jobs? What are their views of the world? Are we going to have people believing in entrepreneurism and other things in sub-Saharan Africa? You're not going to be able to build a continent based on commodities because the value of commodities never has, was able to stand to the level of inflation. So yes, we heard in the 1970s that we're going to run out of oil. Now we have too much oil. And I'm sure by the latter part of the century, the sun, who has four billion years to go by latest projections, will be powering, uh, powering, powering a lot larger percentage. So to me, I am worried about can we provide a meaningful life? What are the jobs of the future? If we look just at the U.S. today and the challenges of the U.S. educational system and the fact that we've gone in the U.S. from a relatively unskilled, it did not require a lot of skills, most of the jobs, to today an environment where only 12% of the jobs are unskilled. We see in the U.S. this huge gap between the jobs of the future. It's not that there aren't jobs, but the people don't have the skills to do the jobs of the future. And if I come back to Ronnie's concern, if the people cannot participate in a 21st century world, okay, they're going to rebel. They're going to want to go back to a different world. And those are the challenges. And so I see we have enormous financial capital. We need to get that capital into find people in the financial industry that want to invest that capital. We need to get it into companies that see opportunities. And if the other companies don't see opportunities, my guess is activist investors or private equity will buy those companies and see those opportunities. But these, to me, are the challenges and the great question that Ronnie raised of the downside of technology. There is no job that is safe. There is no industry that isn't going to be influenced. Whether it's banking or agriculture, whether it's transportation, whether it's retail and healthcare, if today a computer program can read an MRI better than a CAT, you know, in a CAT scan than any radiologist in the world, it isn't even the unskilled worker. It's a person who has a PhD that's now being disintermediated by technology. And so to me, this is our challenge. Do the people feel they have a purpose and a meaning in the world, or don't they? And if they don't, instead of being a contributor, they're going to be a cost to the world. Mike, I sort of feel like uh, it's a really easy job to moderate this panel. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but I think you teed up a really good you know, challenge here. I'm going to point this to, to Steve and Peter. I mean, uh, the vision is there, and I think we, said, we heard this sort of, it's, 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 maybe it's a mindset issue. There are real changes, but there are also real psych, uh, mindset issues around invest, investment. So, I mean, people not sort of taking up this reality, and maybe it's the wrong people. Is it, but is this an investable thesis? Uh, do you find opportunities? <laughs> sure. Um, now, I, I remember when I started uh, in the business and the long bond, this is out of college, was 8 to 9%. So getting a high single-digit um, return was relatively easy you know, if you just wanted to lock it in with, uh, with a bonds, and uh, that's no longer the case. But there's still a lot to do, and there are a lot of themes as a result. There are always going to be themes in any environment that there's going to be themes. And, for instance, in the current environment, whether it was the cost of commodities um, you had these, um, these uh, downgrades in um, investment-grade securities, $170 billion to date, uh, provided a huge opportunity. You look at something like an Anadarko that I mentioned uh, before, where you could get a loan-to-value of 30%, and um, uh, it was one from 250 gets downgraded, goes um, to 600 basis points over um, a huge exaggeration. There are more sellers than buyers. It normalizes. It goes to, uh, to basically to 275 where it is today, even with oil not terribly different than when it was downgraded. And you get uh, opportunities like this each year. 
I, I mentioned before about quasi-sovereign um, debt. This is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, you look at the change in regulation of banks. And um, before, call it the last cycle, it's generally viewed as if they had too much leverage and not enough regulation. Well, guess what? They have uh, a lot more regulation and a lot less leverage, and as a result, can do a lot fewer things. And we're seeing a whole bunch of opportunities, even something as basic as a, a debtor in, in a possession financing, which used to be a very key um, product for banks. Basically, a company would go bankrupt, and uh, they would provide um, super, um, super senior liquidity. Now we're seeing in situations like uh, Peabody Coal, the largest uh, private coal company, goes bankrupt. Banks are the largest investors, largest holders of bank debt, and they don't do the dip. That's a loan to value of 30%. And this is before, um, for those who are looking at, at the coal market, um, there is um, uh, basically two products. One is thermal that heats uh, power plants, and the other is met coal that helps produce steel. Met coal has basically gone parabolic the last um, six months, and that was valued at zero. So when you look at, uh, at the valuation of Peabody, now the loan to value is probably 10 or 15%, and you don't even have banks looking to, to get into the dip now. So they've really stepped away. Um, so we're seeing, um, you know, I think uh, when you look at the premium for illiquidity, particularly after the financial crisis, is huge now. You're talking five, six, seven hundred basis points. So we're seeing a lot to do, even in this current low rate environment. Uh, I was excited to see the statistics. My partners group market capitalization per employee is about 10 million, so we're not that bad <laughs> relative to, to some others. And I would agree with you. I think we see lots of opportunity infrastructure, renewable energy, uh, solar plants in Japan or in Taiwan. Uh, we see uh, telecommunication, uh, subsea cables for data transfer growing uh, hugely in, uh, in tremendous demand for it. Uh, but also in, in much less spectacular businesses, child care, kinder care, uh, a business in the U.S. Uh, that we bought thanks to, uh, to Mike's uh, organization. Uh, so I think there is not a shortage of investment opportunities. I think there are investment opportunities. I think we should maybe think a little bit more systematic about where the blockers are. And for me, one of the big blockers is the pension fund industry. I mean, you have $35 trillion in pension assets, and the incentives are essentially to go liquid and to go government bonds, right? I mean, Italian bonds are deemed to be no risk, uh, whereas obviously long-term <laughs> private equity is deemed to be very, very high risk, uh, which is completely discouraged. Uh, we are right now uh, trying to pioneer defined contribution plans for private markets investments because you would think that uh, where, when there is one area where you would want to encourage people to invest into real assets, it's actually defined contribution plans. It's a huge regulatory barrier. Uh, we now have been successful in Australia. We are right now in the UK. We are trying in the US. But I think to think about how we can de-block regulations and create appropriate incentives on the pension fund industry to go real assets and to go long term. And then the other big element is skills. I think, as Mike said, uh, investing takes skills. And I think we are completely underskilled in the institutional investor space uh, on how to judge, how to create value in investments. And I would applaud uh, Singapore and Singapore authorities. I think what you're doing with GIC, with Temasek, and with MAS uh, to basically create investor skills and then to be partnering uh, with uh, the private markets investing, I think is a huge leverage to essentially get more uh, capital being channeled into real assets. I just want to make one comment, if I could. When you talk about the challenges, some of them that Ronnie talked about, I'd like to just put up a question, if you could pull up slide 81 for a moment, and say, what does the World Bank think the greatest social burdens are in the world that are affecting economics today? So this is the list, and I'll let everyone pick for one second. Okay, now let's look at the answer. And the answer is smoking. So if we look at the greatest social burdens, this is what they estimate are the annual cost to the world's economy. So Ronnie has identified the challenges in number two, and, and my comment is if we don't educate people, that's going to increase. We haven't discussed obesity. 
which is a dominant factor in the U.S. economy, with the U.S. ten times more obese, say, than China, and substantially more than Asia, and with 70, 80 percent of health costs related to weight, if you just look at those challenges. And I'd just like to pull up one other slide, if I could, 31. And I, I want to show you one of the tremendous advantages that Asia has, and that has been the investment in education, lifelong learning. And you can see when a government has the wrong policies, such as the United States. For 40 years, the government in the United States has encouraged people by loaning them money to buy a house they can't afford, or too big a house, or a car. And if the horsepower in your car is worth is eight times as important as the education of your children, you have a big challenge. So if we went back to that in your last slide, and you see where the middle class, this is how the middle class is spending their money. 11 Asian countries on the right and the U.S. on the left. That this commitment to supplemental education throughout Asia, where they're spending about the same uh, on the education of their child as they are in housing and transportation, uh, bodes well for Asia in a knowledge-based society today. And some of the challenges the U.S. had because of obesity and other factors, uh, and too large, too much of an investment in residential housing, we have a middle class that's poor. And it's burdened by its liquidity today that Asia, at the moment, is not burdened by. Yeah, this is a I, I, compelling chart, compelling chart. And so I think it kind of gives us a clue from an Asian perspective what not to invest in. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Ravi, uh, Ronnie, what to invest in? You know, what, what, what do you do here in order to you know, catch, capture this up? I really hear an you know, optimism about the, you know, the, 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 the way to go here, but so practically speaking, we're, 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 what does, how do you steward the resources of Singapore? <laughs> well, I should try to generalize that to some extent because just to pick up uh, Michael's point, uh, I think the, with all the a critical component of success in the future is going to be lifelong learning. Our old notions of uh, education taking up you know, the first 20, 25 years of our lives and then working life beginning after that uh, has been completely rethought. And that's one of the big challenges we are grappling with in Singapore itself. Um, how to operationalize and make real this concept of lifelong learning because almost anything you learn in school is going to be outdated within the first few years of working life with the pace of technological change and advances in knowledge, um, and the need to continually acquire new skills and new capabilities and new exposures. Um, so we need to break this centuries-old divide between education and, and work um, and make it seamless and continuous. And most of our institutions, and this is true in every country, are not set up that way, uh, completely inadequate to this task. Um, so I think one a big area, and I'll be talking principally in the areas as a, as a public servant, principally in the area of public investment, is to get at this problem. How to invest in education that is seamless. Um, we used to have this old notion of adult learning. I think we have to rethink that. And in fact, all of us as adults need to continue to learn. Uh, how are we going to inject that into the economy? And I think there's a big role for public investment to do this. Um, but working with corporates, working with the private sector to make sure that the education that's offered, the training that's offered, is relevant to the needs of industry. So that's one big area. Um, the other one is infrastructure. Uh, Asia needs it, and I would also argue that uh, the advanced economies in Europe and America need it too. Much of the infrastructure in these uh, advanced economies was built uh, 15, 18 years ago, uh, and uh, a lot of it is uh, still around, but not fit for purpose. Uh, if you look at the uh, crumbling infrastructure in some parts of these, uh, some of these countries, that is another reason why there is no confidence in the prospects of future growth, because you don't have a supporting infrastructure. Um, Asia, I think, has been doing a better job at physical infrastructure, um, but needs to do more in the area of digital infrastructure. Um, and this is another big area of public investment that's sorely lacking. Um, another area of investment um, is to equip the world for climate change. Most of our infrastructure, uh, be it in Asia or in Europe or America, are not fit for purpose, again, for a world which is undergoing climate change. Sustainable, green infrastructure is a huge demand. Uh, China has been making some inroads in this direction, 
uh, with smart cities and green cities. There's a lot more to, to go. So there's no shortage of needs and what needs to be done in the future. I think what's lacking is a certain coordination, a certain vision of purpose to, to bring these perspectives together and to act forcefully. Now, of course, the standard argument you hear in the, in the advanced economies is that there's no fiscal space to do that uh, because of the deficits and high levels of debt. Um, and the fear that markets will punish them if they were to engage in large-scale uh, investment of this sort, be it in education, infrastructure, worker retraining, which I think are the three most important places to put your money in. But I think a case can be made that if you can spend your fiscal resources to build future capacity, uh, which is going to boost future growth and future revenues, then the short-term cost of running a larger deficit or borrowing to finance it may be worth it, and you can convince markets uh, of that. But it also means that you need to cut back a lot on uh, wasteful uh, public spending uh, in the area of entitlements, in, in wasteful spending that uh, are taking up a huge drain today. Uh, tax reform is critical. Um, cutting back on uh, reforming social security is critical. Ref and the cutting back on um, a lot of middle class entitlements is very critical to this. Uh, and to, to invest in the future and to invest in a way that is that makes possible the prospect of inclusive growth, that the, that the fruits of globalization are going to be benefiting large segments of the population. And I see no other uh, recourse to that except for public uh, institutions to step in to invest in the future, working alongside the private sector. But today, you don't see that happening in a big way. Uh, some of the countries in Asia are doing it to small extents in our own ways, but until there's a, a global effort on this scale, you don't, you are really not optimizing the multiplier effects that this can bring about. Yeah. Ravi? Well, uh, I'm so glad I'm not Ravi because he has to worry, as a government servant, he has to worry about this and that and the other thing. <laughs> as a private investor, I just go wherever I want. Wonderful, beautiful. Um, uh, he took a uh, sectoral view. Let me take a geographic view. Obviously, smart guys that, such as some of those on this panel will be able to make money anywhere. Uh, but a dumb guy like me, um, you, only, you want to go where the wind is behind you, not ahead of you. And there's only two places I, I'll invest. One is the United States. Economically, it's still by far the, the, the strongest, the most advanced and safest. Currency is still the, 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 the most steady. Uh, the other is uh, Asia, uh, in particular China. And the big game there, I, to summarize it in one word, is upgrade. The last 30 years emphasis was quantity, to build up the quantity, the capacity quick. In the next 30 years, it will be quality. In the old days, as long as you have a house, it's good enough. Now you want a better house. In the old days, you have a car that's good enough. Now you want a better car and on and on and on and on. Services, right? Uh, and so I think that uh, uh, as long as China doesn't get into political and, uh, and social problems, which I think if, I, if I'm a betting man, I'll bet that it will be okay, uh, then uh, – I think that consumerism in China is absolutely uh, a, a booming uh, thing to do uh, in that sector. Anything related to consumerism basically will be fine. But of course, the best is to invest in my company. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I promised the audience I was going to give them a chance to ask, a, I think at this point, a question. So uh, <laughs> if, uh, if the mics are out, then uh, anybody wants to raise their hand, um, I'll try to, uh, try to accommodate other Yep, right there, please. Okay. Can we get a microphone to that gentleman right there? Please say who you are. Thank you for the uh, great conversation. Um, you said uh, uh, you introduced the kind of 70-year uh, cycle. But uh, e even if singularity happens, do you believe the 70 cycle will last and continue? <laughs> If what happened? Um, singularity, in, you know, so artificial intelligence oh. happens. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me tell you one thing. I think the overestimation of technology is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> technology can do a lot of things. But the thing that technology can solve all your problems, think twice. That which I believe is not singularity. What I believe is human nature. The only thing that doesn't change is human nature. And let's face it, technology is made by people, discovered at least by people. And hence, I don't believe that, um, uh, at last time I checked, human nature has not changed. Mm -hmm. And so let's not overestimate the power of technology 
Uh, in this audience, I'm really afraid to disagree with Michael, but I really disagree with Michael. Uh, te <laughs> technology will not solve your public health problems. Well, they, they, they will get us. <laughs> um, I think if we look at what's happened and what we have achieved, and to me, one of the most powerful slides of the 10,000 slides that the Milken Institute prepares for <laughs> these conferences is the 114 years where we've increased life expectancy. Four million years of evolution resulted in an 11-year increase in life expectancy. Four million years. And in 114 years, we've increased life expectancy on the planet by 40 years. And it's now going to be pushing to 80. And it's not only increasing life expectancy. So if you looked at the United States and saw that 20% of the children died before their fifth birthday at the start of the 20th century. And the number one causes were tuberculosis and diarrhea and other types of things. Thank God for technology and penicillin, etc. And we are going to be facing numerous issues here, in my opinion, because of the power of technology. If we just look at the cost of sequencing the human genome, going from 3.8 billion in 13 years to an hour and $1,000, and at Georgia Tech, they sequenced it in seven seconds. So how are you going to treat human beings in precision medicine, we're going to solve these problems. And shouldn't we or shouldn't we get rid of the mosquito that causes Zika virus or malaria? What should we do? Those are issues. And, and, I, and I agree 100% with Ronnie that human emotions. And one of the reasons, and we'll use it later in one of our sessions in the next few days, but one of the reasons that Shakespeare is more popular today than he was hundreds of years ago is that he wrote about human emotions. Love, envy, jealousy, and other indecision. But we should not underestimate the power today of what computers that can do 20 trillion calculations a second can do. You know, they now can win in Go. They can win in chess. And in Scandinavia, if you're treated by the computer program, if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, you're in the hospital less, you have better outcomes, and you take less medicine. So it is changing the world. I think one of the questions Ronnie has, whether it's changing for the better or it's changing it for the worse. And, and, uh, and uh, to me, the fundamental question is, as it changes, will people feel that they have a place in this world? or not. And if they don't, they will probably be destructive to our society rather than constructive. Following that logic, we'll be living a thousand years, <laughs> and I think cycle will get us before we get there. Well, <laughs> on that very optimistic note, I want to thank the panel. I think it's a tribute to the unique position. <laughs> <laughs>